Okay, well, um, thank you very much. It's great to be here. So we'll start this third talk on the discus throw. Okay, uh, at the end of part number two of the series of talks on the discus throw, a question came up, and this is a, a classical question for the discus throw. At the instant of release of the discus, should your feet be still in contact with the ground? Or is it okay for your feet to be off the ground? So the question is, do you want this? Or do you want this? So European coaches in general have classically, they have always been in support of being with ground contact at release. American coaches, they're more ambivalent about it. Some of them say you should be with two feet in contact with the ground at release, and some others say that you can be off the ground, that it's okay either way. So at this point, uh, there's a very important clarification that needs to be made. As I said in the previous two talks, the, the period of time between when the left foot touches the ground and the release of the discus, that is called the delivery phase. And um, all discus throwers are in double support during most of the delivery phase. It's only in the very, very final part of the delivery phase that there are differences. So in that part, some throwers continue with both feet in contact with the ground all the way until release, while others lose contact with the ground and then they release. But what I want to emphasize here is that for most of the delivery phase, everybody is the same. For most of the delivery phase, everybody has two feet in contact with the ground during most of the delivery phase. So we're not looking at the difference between being in ground contact during the entire delivery phase versus being off the ground during the entire delivery phase. Nobody is off the ground during the entire delivery phase. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, how my thinking went about this, this, this question, whether you should release with the feet still on the ground or if you should release after your feet have left the ground. So in the 1970s and 1980s, I thought that the best way to throw the discus was to be in contact all the way to the end, contact with the ground with the feet, all the way until release. It made good sense from a biomechanical standpoint that it was made good sense. And there was a good logic to explain why you should be in contact with the ground all the way until release. So at that time, I accepted this completely. I, you need to stay in contact with the ground all the way until the disc is released, is released. So I was in agreement with uh, the standard view of most European coaches. Well, that was in the 1970s and 1980s. And at that time, our knowledge of the biomechanics of the discus throw was very superficial. There are many things we did not know. So I made my first biomechanical studies of the discus in the 1990s. And the results that I got there made me change my mind. So I'm going to give you here a little uh, uh, sketch, uh, a roadmap for how I'm going to make this talk. Okay, so first I will talk about the production of horizontal velocity of the discus and how it is affected by being in support or not being in support. And later we'll talk, I'll talk about the production of vertical velocity for the discus. So for the explanations about the production of horizontal velocity, I will use a simple example based on translation to explain the advantage of being in ground support at release. And then I will use a slightly more complex example that is based on rotation 
to again explain the advantage of being in ground support at release. And at this point, we all will be in agreement. We will say, oh yes, being in support all the way to the end, that is the way to go. That is the best way to throw. But then I will show that if there is an advantage in being in ground support at release, that advantage will have to be small. And then beyond that, I'll show that maybe there is no advantage, not only small advantage, but no advantage in being in ground support at release. And maybe there is even a disadvantage in being in ground support at release. And then if we look at the vertical velocity of the discus, we will find that, I will show that, for the production of vertical velocity is a clear disadvantage in being in ground support at release. Okay, so to explain what is good and what is bad in the technique, we could follow various lines of logic, uh, and we can look at the, we can explain the advantages and disadvantages of having the feet on the ground or off the ground at the time of release, and these different lines of logic, different ways of explaining things, they look different superficially, but in the end, they all are perfectly compatible with each other. So I will explain a couple of these different logics to you. The first example will be using translation. So let's imagine a person who is sitting on a chair and is throwing a metal ball forward. It's like a shot. And uh, it's gonna be a very simple horizontal push. And at a certain point in this throw, here we have the person like halfway through this throw. And, and at this point, let's say that the shot has a velocity of 10 meters per second forward. And how did we get to this point? Well, the thrower in the period before this must have made a force forward on the shot. And that produces this horizontal velocity of 10 meters per second. But by reaction, the ball pushes backward on the hand. And that force backward tries to make the person plus the chair translate backward. But the legs of the chair are in contact with the ground. So as the legs try to move backward, they scratch backward against the ground. And by reaction, the, the chair is making a backward force on the ground, and the ground will make a forward force on the chair. So what we have is that the, the thrower has received a backward force from the shot, but a forward force from the ground. And these two forces will be equal in size and opposite in direction. So when you add them together, those two forces add up to zero. So therefore the person plus the chair will not move in any direction. So the, the speed, the velocity of the person at the time when the shot has reached the 10 meters per second, the person velocity is zero meters per second. So we have that, the velocity, oh, you can't see that number there. <laughs> so the velocity of the shot relative to the ground is 10 meters per second, and the speed of the shot relative to the person, relative to the shoulder, will also be 10 meters per second. Okay, all right. So let's see now a different example. Okay, so in this case now, it's gonna be the same kind of throw, horizontal forward throw, but your chair is going to have wheels. So the shot will have received 10 meters per second of forward velocity. And that will have been produced by a forward force made by the hand on the ball. And by reaction, the ball on the hand will have made a backward force. So this is all up to here is the same as in the previous. However, now, so, so this backward force uh, pushes the person plus the chair backward. But 
because the 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 wheel the, the the chair is on wheels, there will not be a forward force to stop the backward movement. So the person plus the chair will actually move backward. So the person and the chair will be moving backwards. How fast will they be moving backward? Well, it depends on what is the mass of the shot, and it depends on what is the mass of the person plus the chair. So for example, so for example, let's say that the mass of the shot is seven kilos, and the mass of the person plus the chair is 70 kilos. In this case, the backward speed of the person plus the chair will be one meter per second backward. So what does this do? Well, in this situation, the velocity of the shot relative to the ground is still the same 10 meters per second. However, the velocity of the shot relative to the shoulder will be 11 meters per second. And this is a problem because the faster the shot moves relative to the shoulder, the more, the, the faster the concentric conditions of the muscles. So this, the, the, the concentric conditions of the muscles, in this case, it will be the triceps primarily, the concentric conditions in the first case, they would be relatively fast. In the top case, they'll be faster. So what we have is this. The shot in both cases is moving at the same speed relative to the ground, 10 meters per second. But in the bottom situation, the muscles can make bigger forces. And in the top situation, the muscles can make smaller forces. So if we want to see how the shot is going to get accelerated from this point onward, in the situation in the bottom, you will be able to make a larger acceleration of the shot. So, so from here onward, at this point, both have 10 meters per second. But after this, the situation on the bottom, the speed of the shot will increase more quickly than in the situation on the top. So the situation in the bottom is the better one. All right, let's look now at a third possibility. And in this one, the person is standing on the ground and the shot has reached again 10 meters per second. And this has happened because the hand has made a forward force on the shot. And by reaction, the shot has made a backward force on the hand. Now, in this case, the legs are in contact with the ground. So the athlete, the person, the thrower, can choose to make a very big backward force on the ground if he wants to. So that'll be a bigger force. See that purple force is bigger than the one in the intermediate picture. And the reaction therefore will also be bigger. So this reaction force here can be bigger than this backward force here. So by the time that the shot reaches these 10 meters per second of forward velocity, the body of the thrower may be also moving forward, maybe at one meter per second. So this is an advantage because in this case, again, we have the velocity of the shot relative to the ground is 10 meters per second, but the velocity of the shot relative to the shoulder is only nine meters per second. And this is an advantage because this means that the arm muscles will be in slower concentric conditions so they can make a bigger force on the shot. So what we have here is that the intermediate position is a good technique. On the top, bad situation. And the bottom is the best. Okay, now, if we look at the top situation, imagine a person that is not on a chair. Imagine a person that makes a little jump up and then pushes the shot horizontally. Well, the situation would be very similar to what we have with the, with the wheels on the chair. 
So as you push the shot forward, your body will move backward. And this is bad because it means that at the shoulder joint and at the elbow joint, the motions will be faster. And therefore, the muscles will be in fast concentric conditions, which are weaker conditions. Okay, so it is to your advantage to be in ground contact during the push on the projectile. So we'll see now another example. So this will use rotation, and it will be an example of a peculiar kind of discus throw. It's called a standing discus throw. So we will see that in this situation, there's also an advantage in staying in ground support during the entire delivery phase. And again, it's because it allows the arm musculature, in, in this case, the pectoral muscle, to be in slower concentric conditions. And in these conditions, you can make larger forces with the muscle. In questa maniera, si può esprimere una forza maggiore. And in those slower concentric conditions are associated with obtaining a larger amount of angular momentum from the ground. So let's take a look at a discus throw here, seen from above. So let's say that the right arm, the one that has the discus, let's say that it's rotating counterclockwise at 1,000 degrees per second. And what is propelling that, that arm in the discus is the right pectoral muscle. So because the arm is rotating very fast counterclockwise, the right pectoral muscle will be in very fast concentric conditions. And these are weak conditions. We would like the right pectoral muscle to be in slower concentric conditions. It will be slower, but it will be stronger. So how can we do that? Well, we can achieve that by having the trunk also rotating counterclockwise. So for example, let's say that the right arm is rotating counterclockwise at 1,000 degrees per second. But let's say that the trunk, this is unlikely, but let's say that the trunk also is rotating counterclockwise at also at 1,000 degrees per second. So the this is the trunk, this is the arm. If the arm rotates through a certain number of degrees in a certain amount of time, the trunk rotates to the same number of degrees in the same time. So in this case, the, the, what will, will, the movement of the shoulder will be like this. There will, be no, there will be no movement in the shoulder itself. So you have that. So in this case, the muscle, the right pectoral muscle would be in isometric conditions which are very strong conditions, but that is unrealistic. The trunk, the arm can be rotating at a thousand degrees per second. That is realistic, but the trunk will not be rotating at a thousand. Maybe it'll be rotating at 200 degrees per second, counterclockwise. But that is still a good thing because it means that relative to the trunk, the arm is rotating not at 1,000 degrees per second, but at 800 degrees per second. So how do you achieve this? How can you get the trunk to rotate counterclockwise at the same time as the, the arm and the discus are also rotating counterclockwise? You do it by pushing with your feet on the ground with these blue forces. So the left leg will push to the right, and the right leg will push to the left. And by reaction, the ground makes equal and opposite forces on the feet. This produces a torque, a counterclockwise torque, and that produces counterclockwise angular momentum, which is good because remember, we want to have counterclockwise angular momentum in the trunk. All right, so this is very good, but what happens if you're off the ground? Well, then you cannot make the flu, the blue forces on the ground, and therefore you will not receive the red forces from the ground. So they will be gone, 
and then you're getting no angular momentum from the ground, no additional counterclockwise angular momentum from the ground. Okay, so what we've seen here is essentially the logic followed in the 1970s and 1980s to reach the conclusion that staying in ground contact during the entire delivery phase is the best way to throw the discus. And this is very good logic. This is very good thinking, but there's some things that they did not know. <laughs> I'll show you some problems with this interpretation. So let's say that if you stay in contact with the ground all the way to the end during the delivery phase, um, you can produce 20% more angular momentum than if you lose contact early. We don't know if it's going to be 20%, but let's say, let's be, let's be generous. <laughs> so it's a little bit optimistic, but let, let's, let's play with this idea. Okay. Now, 20% increase in angular momentum would be very good. That would be an excellent improvement. And it would help you to produce much more horizontal speed for the discus. But you have to remember that from what we saw in lectures one and two, uh, the angular momentum is not generated mainly in the delivery phase. It's generated mainly in the early part of the throw, in the back of the circle. So roughly about 90% of the angular momentum about the vertical axis, 90% of that is produced in the early part of the throw, in the back of the circle, and only about the remaining 10% is produced in the delivery phase. So we were thinking, oh, you can generate 20% more angular momentum when you're in contact with the ground. But no, you don't generate 20% of the whole angular momentum. You can generate a 20% increase in the small amount of angular momentum that you produce in the delivery phase. So it would be a 20% increase in the 10% of angular momentum that is produced in the delivery phase. And 20% of 10% is 2% of the total angular momentum. So the total advantage that you may get from being in, in ground support all the way to the end is much smaller. If, 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 it, if it exists and we're thinking at this point, oh yeah, there'll be an improvement but it will be a small improvement all of it, only. So why didn't the coaches in the 1970s and 1980s, why didn't they realize this? And the reason is that they thought that most of the angular momentum was produced during the delivery phase. So in the discus throw, as I explained in talks one and two, in the discus throw, there are two very important interactions. One is the interaction of the thrower with the ground, which is angular momentum. And the other one is the interaction of the thrower with the discus, which transmits angular momentum from the thrower to the discus. And in the 1970s and 1980s, it was believed that both of these interactions occurred mainly during the delivery phase. So the idea was that you started the throw from the back part of the circle, and you went very quietly, very easy, don't make much of an effort, just rotate counterclockwise, go across the circle, and land in the front of the circle. And then the important goal was to have, yes, a little bit of angular momentum, probably not much, and then be sure to reach a good position when you land in the front of the circle. And then you explode during the delivery phase. So you would get angular momentum from the ground, and then you would pass that angular momentum to the discus. So interaction with the ground, interaction with the discus, both were happening in the delivery phase. That's what they thought. So they thought that almost everything happened in the delivery phase. And in the 1970s and 80s, I also thought the same way. 
it was only later after research was done that we know that the interaction of the thrower and the discus, yes, that happens in the delivery phase. But the interaction between the thrower and the ground, the generation of angular momentum, that one does not occur mainly in the delivery phase. It happens early in the throw in the back part uh, of the circle. So these coaches were trying to, to, to produce a good percent improvement in a very tiny part of the throw. Okay, so the improvement in the angular momentum will probably, well, it's definitely not anything like 20%, it's more like maybe 2%, but 2% improvement is better than 0% improvement. So at this point in our discussion, we have found that staying in ground support until after you release the discus will not produce a huge improvement, but it will produce some improvement. Well, I'll take some improvement over zero improvement. So at this point in our discussion, it seems that staying in contact with the ground is better than releasing the discus when you are in the air. It's not amazingly better, but it is a little bit better. So it seems like a good idea still. Okay, so now we're gonna be looking at some numbers about just how big are these improvements and, and is there really an improvement? Okay, so what I uh, decided to do is I, I measured uh, angular momentum and the differences in the production of angular momentum. This is angular momentum about the vertical axis. It's a horizontal plane. Uh, I wanted to measure the differences in production of this angular momentum between throwers who release in the air and throwers who release on the ground. Okay, so I could have looked at how much angular momentum is produced in the delivery phase and compared the uh, release on uh, in the air and release on the ground. Another way to do it, which is what I did, is I looked of the total angular momentum at release, what percentage of that is produced in the delivery phase? So here we have men, we have 24 men, and some of them release in the air, some of them release in ground support. And uh, we always talk about how, I've said about how in the final uh, delivery phase, you produce about 10% of the total angular momentum. Well, it's not exactly 10%, so we're gonna be seeing here numbers that are different from 10%, but they're roughly around 10%, 12%, 9%, numbers like that. So what we find is that people who released in the air, they produce 10.7% of their total angular momentum. They produce that in the, um, delivery phase. And now the, the, the people who release, the men who release in ground support, we expect them to have a larger percent generation of angular momentum in the delivery phase. But this is what we got. They produce less percentage. Surprisingly, they produce less percentage of the total angular momentum in the delivery phase. Okay, let's look at the women now. Uh, there's 17 women, and when they released in the air, the ones who released in the air, they produced 14.7% of their angular momentum during the delivery phase. So again, the ones who release in ground support, we would expect them to produce a bigger percentage, but no. They produce less angular momentum than the ones who released in the air. Okay, so this is for both the men and the women. This is very surprising. It's uh, not what we expected based on the logic. At this point, we're going to have to look a little bit at statistics. Okay, we're going to be doing a test called a t-test. <laughs> 
okay, why do we need this test? Okay, um, ideally, if I wanted to compare men who release in the air and men who release in the ground, uh, ideally, I would have gone out there and measured every single person, every single thrower in the world who releases in the air and every single thrower in the world who releases on the ground. And I would have measured these percentage values. So you look at the average angular momentum produced by one group, average angular momentum produced by the group. So we would call this measuring the entire population. But what do we have? But that would take a lot of work. So we cannot do that. So we have to work with a sample. Okay, so we're looking at a sample, right? Yeah. So in our sample, in our sample here, we have that the people who release in the air on average produced more angular momentum than the people who released on the ground. But the, there could be a problem because maybe our samples are not good representations of the entire population. So this could be a problem. So um, I'll give you uh, an example that is not about the discus throw. So this is, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about statistics and a lot of the people in the audience probably already know this. So they will be falling asleep while I talk about it, but other people may not know it. So I have to talk about this. Okay, so let's imagine that no disc is here. We're talking about, we want to know if the people in Sweden are taller or shorter than the people in Japan. So ideally, again, we take we go to Sweden and measure everybody in Sweden. Then we go to Japan and we measure everybody in Japan. Average, average, you compare the two averages and that's it, end of story. Okay. But the problem is that's a lot of work again. So we're going to be using two samples. One yeah. sample, we'll, we'll be using two samples, uh, maybe one sample of Swedish people, 20 people. So I go, I make a random sample. I close my eyes, you, 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 you. I get 20 people from Sweden. Then I go to Japan and I go, you, 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 randomly. And I choose another 20 people. So... Normally, if you do that, let's say that the average height of a person, in, a male in Sweden is maybe 1.80. Well, my sample may not come out at 1.80. Maybe it'll be 181, 179. It will be close to 180. And in Japan, maybe my sample will come out to be, let's say that the average height of Japanese is maybe for male Japanese is 170. Well, my, my, my sample may come out of 171, 169. So when I compare my two samples, yeah, the Swedish look taller than the Japanese. Everything is okay. But I could be unlucky. I may wind up in my 20 people in Sweden. Maybe I'll have eight normal standard Swedish people and the other 12 are maybe the Swedish national gymnastics team. I, I did sample them randomly. I went like this, but by bad luck, I, I got 12 gymnasts. And when I make my sample in Japan, I have eight normal standard Japanese people, but the other 12 were from the Japanese national basketball team. So when I look at my samples, they may say Japanese sample is taller on average than the Swedish sample. I that can happen always. So it can, it can happen. Normally it does not happen, <laughs> it can happen. Okay, so what factors affect the, the possibility that you can have a bad sample? These, this last example was, was a terrible sample, right? Bad luck. How can I, what factors can produce a bad sample? One factor that affects it is the size of the sample. If your size of the sample instead of 20 is like five, then it's more possible that you're gonna get a crazy result. Another factor is the amount of variation within your sample. It's this number here, this plus or minus seven, plus or minus 10.9. If that number is very big, 
that can also be a problem. Okay, so we could just say, okay, forget it. We'll never know. <laughs> but no, because there are special uh, calculations that can be made, which are called statistical tests. So in this test called the t-test, uh, I'm going to compare my two samples and do some mathematical cal calculations. And the t-test, the which is one of many possible statistical tests, is going to give us a value called the p-value. Um, in this case, the p-values are 0 0.11 for the men and 0 0.09 for the women. To keep it simple, let's think of them as being 0 0.10 for both. And I will explain um, uh, what is the meaning of this, these p-values, what they tell us. So we're comparing two different groups of people, right? We're comparing the, the people who release in the air with the people who release on the ground. So it's group A and group B. Well, at the end of this little project that we have here, we will be, will be uh, uh, having a conclusion at the end of this. And there's three possible conclusions we can produce. One of them is group A has bigger values. The other one is that group B has bigger values. And the third one is, we don't know. We cannot really trust our data. Okay, of these three possibilities, the possibility that release in ground support produces more angular momentum, that is, we'll never get that result from this sample. Maybe it produces more, but we cannot prove it. Now, so this leaves us with two other possibilities. Maybe the release in the air produces more angular momentum, or we don't know. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say release in the air produces more angular momentum. I could be correct or I could be mistaken. The p-value tells you what is the likelihood that that conclusion is wrong. So a possibility of p of 0 0.1 is 10%. So when I say release in the air produces more angular momentum, there are 90% probabilities, 90% probability that I am correct in saying that, and 10% probability that no, no, releasing ground support actually is, is the one that produces more angular momentum. Mm -hmm. So um, normally, in if this if I were going to write this up in a scientific publication, they would want to have even a more extreme probability. They would say, no, you need to have p be equal to zero point zero five. So that would mean that when I say if this were zero point zero five, that would mean that when I say release in the air produces more angular momentum the likelihood that I am wrong is 5%, and the likelihood that I am right is 95%. So they're more strict. So here, we're not going to publish this in the scientific publication. So we have that with a p equals 0 0.10, 0 0.11, 0 0.09, basically 0 0.10. With that value of p, when I say release in the air, produces more angular momentum than release on the ground. I am this 90, there's the chances of nine to one that I am correct. That's pretty good. Not enough for scientific publication, but it's pretty good. So I'm not going to say, yes, we have proved, we have proven that release in the air produces more angular momentum. But I will say, it looks a lot like you produce more angular momentum when you release in the air. Okay, so the final thing is that in, in regard to this horizontal velocity of the discus and the generation of angular momentum is even in this talk, I'm not going to say I have proved that release in the air produces more angular momentum. I will not say that. I will say that 
it's very likely, but I it's I don't consider it to be perfect proof. It's pretty good, but not perfect. Okay, so it looks like you produce more angular momentum when you release in the air, but it still leaves the question, why? Because we expected release on the ground to produce a little bit more angular momentum than release in the air. Well, I don't have uh, a perfect explanation for it, but I have a theory about why that is. And I will talk about that a little bit later. All logic is saying you should get more angular momentum when you're releasing ground support. But we're getting, very likely, a smaller angular momentum when you release in ground support. OK, so um, we leave for now the production of horizontal velocity of the discus. I'm going to be talking about production of vertical velocity for the discus. And with this, there, there's several different ways you can look at this. But the one I'm going to be looking at is I'm going to be looking at uh, the upward vertical velocity of the thrower at release. If you remember when we talked about the, the battleship shooting a cannon, if the ship is traveling forward in the same direction as the cannon shoots, the cannon will produce a larger velocity for the projectile. In the same way, and now we're talking about the vertical direction, if the battleship, if the, uh, if the throwing platform, which is really the thrower, if the thrower is traveling up, when the thrower generates upward vertical velocity for the discus, the thrower will be able to produce more vertical velocity for the discus. So the question is, uh, I want to get the vertical velocity of the thrower, but at what time? I could look at the vertical velocity at release, and uh, really the, the acceleration, the propulsion of the discus, though, happens over a certain amount of time. It's not just instantaneously at release. So instead of looking at the vertical velocity of the thrower at release, I'm going to be looking at the vertical velocity of the thrower in the last quarter of a turn. So the discus at this point is moving in an inclined plane. So the discus goes from a high position, comes down to a low position, and then a quarter of a turn later gets released. So we're looking from the lowest point of the discus until release, which is the last 90 degrees of, of motion of the discus. And the discus in that time goes from a vertical velocity of zero to the vertical velocity at release. So I'm going to be looking at the average vertical velocity of the body during that last quarter turn of the discus. OK, so let's see. Again, we have our men, 24. Again, same people. Release in the air, release some ground support. And what are we going to be looking at here is vertical velocity during that last quarter turn of the discus, vertical velocity of the thrower during that last quarter turn of the discus. So it's 1.5 meters per second. These are the people who release in the air. The one who release in ground support, they have 1.1 meters per second. So less vertical velocity when you release in ground support. Remember that the, the good thing is to have as much upward velocity as possible. And then we look at the women. Release in the air, 1.3. Release some ground support, 0 0.9. So again, when you release in ground support, the body of the thrower has less upward vertical velocity. And when we do a t-test and we look at our p-values, ah, you can't see them. But this one up here is 0 0.01. This one down here is 0 0.0. .0 zero, one. These are good enough for publication. <laughs> so it's clear that the, the people who release in the air have more upward velocity than the people who release in ground, in ground support. And this makes sense. This makes a lot of sense. Because think about it. Uh, 
all of the men in this sample, if they wanted to, they all could release with their feet in the air. And the same way in the women, uh, most of them, and probably all of them also, could also, if they wanted to, they could push on the ground hard enough to be off the ground at the time of release. But we see here that some of them don't get off the ground, right? They're releasing ground support. How do they do that? So if they wanted to, they could get off the ground, but they don't. And it's because their coach tells them, no, you have to be in contact with the ground. So what the throwers do, these throwers, what they do is they do not push on the ground very hard. They inhibit their muscles so that they do not push in the vertical direction very hard. So the idea, I mean, what they think is that, yes, I'm getting less vertical velocity, but I am not getting off the ground, so I'm having a big advantage in the horizontal velocity. So they're thinking, um, by not getting off the ground, I'm having small upward vertical velocity, and that's not good, but, well, maybe they don't know that they're getting less vertical velocity, but that yeah. is not good. But they're thinking that, oh, but in the horizontal direction, what we saw earlier, I am in contact with the ground. I can generate more angular momentum. So okay. overall, this is better. So that's what we think. But we've seen that, no, <laughs> you have no advantage in the horizontal direction. In fact, it's very likely, not certain, but very likely that they can produce less horizontal velocity by being on the ground. And here in the vertical direction, this is definitely a, a disadvantage, not having as much upward vertical velocity. Okay, so um, this brings us to remember, we were trying to know why is it that in the horizontal direction, you do not generate more angular momentum when your feet are in contact with the ground. So there's two things you're doing with your feet in the delivery phase. One thing is that you're pushing downward on the ground with the two feet. That gives you upward linear velocity. The other thing that you want to do when you're in the delivery phase is you want to do pull, push, pull backward with the right foot, pull, push forward with the left foot, so doing this action, that helps you to generate more angular momentum. All throwers do both of these things. They push down and they do a pull push. But we know that the ones who release in ground support produce less upward vertical velocity. So we know that they're making a smaller downward force on the ground with the two feet. So they are inhibiting. There are certain muscles that you use to push downward with the feet and different muscles that you use to do a pull push with the feet. So the ones that stay in contact with the ground are inhibiting the muscles that make the feet push downward. And what I think may be happening is that accidentally, they're also inhibiting the leg muscles that make you do a pull push. This is just a speculation. I don't know if this is what's happening, but it's my best guess uh, as to what is happening. So here's a summary. So releasing the discus while still in contact with the ground versus releasing the discus with the feet in the air probably has only a small effect on the result of the throw, small effect. So you cannot lose too much sleep over it. So, in the vertical velocity, releasing the discus in the air produces more vertical velocity for the thrower. And this should be helpful for the production of more vertical velocity for the discus. So for producing vertical velocity, being on the ground is bad. In the vertical direction, in the horizontal direction, theoretically, Theoretically, being with two feet on the ground should allow you to produce more angular momentum about the vertical axis, and it should be a good thing. But in practice, it produces less angular momentum.
So releasing with uh, the feet on the ground, if anything, is a little bit worse than releasing with the feet in the air. Okay, and that's the end of the talk. Thank you.